Ahoy, Skipper! Here we go. Here we go. It is the 4th of January, 2024. As hard as that is to believe, it's here. And I want to make sure that you guys don't have near as much pain next year as you had last week. (laughs) So, (laughs) I don't know about anybody else, but I like, you know, I talk about the flywheel method and how when you get this flywheel moving, the momentum of the wheel itself progresses you forward faster and faster and faster. And I could totally feel that happening at this point. Like last year, I know the year before I really didn't do much. So my flywheel had kind of come to a screeching halt and I was just kind of stuck and stagnant. And, you know, I mean, it was okay. It was nothing that, that really did any damage to me, but Yes, or last year, you know, I made that promise to you guys that, hey, you know, I'm going to start doing this stuff and prove that this stuff actually still works. So that's pretty much what I did last year. And now my flywheel, after one year of that, it's it's on the move. I can feel the I can feel the progression and the, the momentum forward. And it's pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool deal. So that's what I want. For you guys, I want you guys to feel the power and the momentum of that flywheel when it gets in motion. But you got to do stuff. You know, the flywheel itself is, it's a heavy object and it's hard to move. It's sitting there and it's like, it it seems impossible to, to make it move. But I guarantee if you push on it and you push on it and you put enough pressure, that thing will move. And once it starts moving it's hard to stop, which, you know, that's momentum. That's business momentum that gets behind you and and propels you forward. So it's, it's a really, really cool deal. So if you look at like what I've accomplished in the last year from doing that, I found a team, put a team together, built a new product, came up with just, you know, a phenomenal thing, putting the marketing together did a launch, built a list, all that stuff. I didn't have any of that the year before. Acquisition error wasn't even a thought. But it was like, you know, when I hit that point, I said, okay, what am I going to do in 2023? It's like, I need to come up with something new and spectacular. All this shit I've got is getting pretty old and old moldy. <laughs> <laughs> so that I was, you know, and I had no idea what it was going to be. It was just... I started the thought process. And when you do that, things start appearing. They start showing themselves to you when you start looking for them. And, you know, that's like opportunity. If you're not focused on opportunity, there's all kinds of opportunity around you you won't see. If you're if you're hyper-focused on opportunity and you haven't identified what an opportunity really is, you you could get inundated with stuff that will slow you down and and basically bring your flywheel to a screeching halt and that's taking on stuff you shouldn't be taking on you know that's looking at your at your SWOT analysis you know what are your strengths what are your opportunities <clears throat> what are your weaknesses and, and threats and threats a threat to me like the biggest threat to me is time things that are going to take my time away from me. So I am very, very protective of my time. So when I look at opportunities, I'm like, okay, the first thing is how much time is this going to take? And what am I going to get out of it? So if it, if, if that stuff doesn't match up, it doesn't really show up on my radar as an opportunity. So it's just, you know, it's, it's a way you look at things in business. So, This year, we're fresh into it. We're four days in. So you guys need to identify first, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses that you should just steer clear of? Those are not opportunities. Although a lot of times they present themselves as such. There's a lot of things that, you know, will show up literally just like being dropped on your doorstep and you see it as an opportunity, but it's really not. It's going to derail you. It's going to keep you away from from what you really should be doing. 
So looking at that, figuring out what you have in your business or what you can build or what you can part of or, you know, anything like that, that's going to propel you forward in 2024. Those are the opportunities you need to, to identify so you can start looking for them and then they'll start appearing. So really, really cool stuff. And, and along with that is, is going to come some, some really cool experiences. You know, when you start getting little wins, like I can't tell you how excited I was when we did the black Friday launch and every, everybody like jumped on acquisition air and it just verified that I was on the right track, that I had done the right thing that will make you feel really good. And, and to me, that will make you be willing to do things you weren't willing to do before. <laughs> like, like for instance, I haven't been to a trade show to exhibit in many, many years. And when I got this thing going, the flywheel started going, it was like, I should probably go to traffic and conversion. You know, that was like, and before that, it was like, oh, hell no. I wanted no part of that. I want no part of setting up a booth and standing there for three days talking to people. But as this thing came to life, it's like, okay, that's what I probably really should do. And all of a sudden now it doesn't look near as bad. And, you know, the, the excitement and the momentum and, and, and just cool stuff. Like I have, uh, you know, acquisition air, right? You, you want an airline, so you need planes. So the, the, the planes need to appear. <laughs> so this is, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's got acquisition air on the little plane. It's a squeeze ball. It's like a stress ball. We'll be giving these out at TNC. So it's really cool. Now, I've always been of the opinion, if you're going to make a scene, you want to be seen. So imagine all the acquisition air balls flying all over the conference center. I'm taking 250 of these things. And hopefully these things will be flying all over when they're in their conference. I'm going to be Do you have the t-shirt with the question, have you got big balls? <laughs> got balls? <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> That's awesome. But uh, it's going to be a one-two punch. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm looking at this now, not as a, a dreaded experience. We're going to have a blast. It's going to be a lot of fun. And in the process, I think we're going to get some incredible momentum going, get some really good prospects through the door. And, uh, and really, like, I think the flywheel's going right now. It hasn't even started yet. It really hasn't. I mean, we're so fresh and new into this thing that I can't wait for that thing to take a full, a full rotation and then really start kicking in gear. So that's what, that's what you want to do in your business, you know, and you've got to get that flywheel started. So and it doesn't, it doesn't just happen. It's like, you can't just will this into existence. You have to start doing things. You know, I've talked about this. You can learn until you're blue in the face, but until you actually start taking action and doing things like I guarantee every one of you on here now knows what a big idea is and you know what a lead magnet is. But how many of you have an effective lead magnet in place right now collecting leads for you? I don't care if you've got anything to sell to them. That's the first step. The first step is not selling. The first step is building an army, building a following, creating demand and desire, well, actually, the first step is grabbing their attention. And that's the big idea. And then you pull them in, get them onto your list. If you don't have a list and you don't have a big idea to start this process, your flywheel is stuck. It's sitting there and it's not going to move. That's the first step to get that flywheel moving. You've got to be able to generate prospects. So... 
like I said, you all know how to do a big idea. You know the concept there. Maybe you need help. That's what this is for. So show up, you know, show us what your big idea is. We'll help you sharpen the sword. But the big idea should lead to a giveaway, a lead magnet. Again, by now, you guys all know what a lead magnet is. It's a free thing you can give away to help your prospect take a step forward and gain confidence that they can actually get what they want. It's not a huge thing. It's, it's a very small thing to just help them take that first step. By them taking that action, it tells them internally, I can do this. And that eliminates probably your biggest objection hurdle is a lot of people won't get interested. They won't participate in your marketing because they just don't believe it. They don't think they can do it. So when you give them that proof that they can do it, that's what your lead magnet should be. Again, the perfect way to design a lead magnet is to look at the timeline. Look at where that person is, where they currently are in their timeline and where they want to be. You know, maybe they have a business right now and they're not getting customers. They want to get customers easily, quickly, effortlessly. That's their desired outcome. But is it really? Why do they want that? You got to push to the end of the timeline. Why do they want what they want or what they think they want? Because that's where your emotion is going to be. That's where your buying triggers are going to be. Not in the initial thing. You got to push harder. Why do they want that? What's it going to do for them? You know, and a lot of times it will be freedom. People in business crave freedom, whether they know it or not. That's why they're there. They hate being restricted. They hate the idea of a job. They hate the idea of being ruled by someone. They want freedom. They want to break out of that. So, if you know that, you can have a conversation with them that will really pull them in. It will draw them in and it will start creating demand and desire. But again, now you've got this ugly thing that rears its head called an objection. In the back of their mind, they're thinking, I'm not worthy. I can't do this. I've tried this before. All this negative shit exists in their head. And to them, it is real. It's absolutely 100% real. You cannot show up and say that's not real. You're, it's, it, that is argumentative and that's not something you ever want to do. If you're trying to build trust and rapport with somebody, you don't enter into an argument with them. You lead them to safety. You let them take them on a guided tour to discover what they need to discover. That's the best way to do that. You know, to me, a lead magnet that will allow them to take the first step is a perfect bridge, perfect bridge for you to get them onto the first rock they need to get onto to cross the stream and not get wet. So that think of it that way. You're giving them rocks to go from one to the next, and the closer they get to that far shore, the more they're going to want it. And the more they want it, guess what? The more they'll pay for it, the more likely they are to pay for it the more they will pay to get there. So, and the perfect example of this, I haven't, I haven't talked about this in a while, so some of you that are new might not ever have heard this, but there is a guy, um, his actual real name is Eben Pagan, and his internet stage name was David D'Angelo. And his product is he sells dating advice. He's a dating coach. <clears throat> and... What he realizes, he looked at the timeline and he, he created the absolute 100%, in my opinion, perfect lead magnet to give away as the first step. And what he said is he said, if he knew what they wanted or he knew what they said they wanted, here's, here's the key. They said they wanted dating advice. They said they want to know how to go on a date. Well, that's bullshit. That's what they said. That's not what they really wanted. They wanted sex. Some of them might have wanted marriage. Some of them might have wanted a lifetime partner. But the dating was not what they really wanted. They cringed at the idea of that. But that's what they said. You know, I, I, I 
you know, and they, and they had all this negative shit in their head that prevented them from getting there. Right. So David or Eben, rather, his real name, we'll call him Eben. Eben realized that he looked at the timeline and he nailed it. He said, if you can't talk to women, he said, this is your problem. This is the thing that is going to prevent you from ever dating, meaning sex, right? That's a pretty high trigger. You tell somebody they're never, never going to have sex because they don't know how to talk to women. It's like, you just put a very large goal in front of them that was very action oriented. Oh my God, I need to know how to talk to women, right? Because without that, I'm never going to have sex. And, you know, some guys, you might as well just shoot them in the head if you tell them that, right? Okay. <laughs> so talk about the emotion here. He just put a box on him. He just shined the light on the problem that is going to prevent them from ever getting what they want, right? First step, you have to be able to talk to women. If you can't talk to women, there ain't no way you're getting the sex, right? That's pretty cut and dry. That's that's pretty believable, right? You can intuitively put that together. Well, yeah, I, I get that. I see that. I understand that. And I'm still scared to talk to women. I, I don't know how to do it. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of rejection. All that negative shit that exists in their head. So he created the perfect lead magnet. He said, I'm going to show you in three simple steps how to talk to women. I'm going to eliminate that problem. I'm going to take it away. I'm going to give you a magic power. <clears throat> and he, he had so many downloads the first year of that lead magnet. It was absolutely ridiculous. And it led him with, when he started this business within three years, his flywheel was moving and couldn't be stopped. He was doing $20 million a year in sales of dating advice. And it was all because he grabbed their attention and he gave them the first step. And the first step was the confidence that, oh my God, I can do this. So they downloaded and what they got was this little PDF that said, here's the three things you need to do to be able to talk to women, right? And the first thing was like, show up where they are. Pretty obvious, right? This The second thing was how to approach them in a non-offensive way and how to identify who will actually want to talk to you. So you don't, so you eliminate the rejection. He was showing them a way to do it where they were safe. They weren't going to get hurt. They weren't going to have their worst nightmare come to life. So anyway, he gave them that and it worked. Like almost all of them tried it. It worked. If they tried it, that's the key. If they tried it, it worked. Because as you know, it's not that hard to talk to a woman. It's just like talking to anyone else, right? Having a conversation. But what he did was he said, take all the expectations out. You in your head were thinking about talking them into sex. That's not how it works. You just, you need to talk to them first. So when he showed them how to do it, they all realized, oh my God, I can, I can actually talk to women. Well, what do you think that did to their confidence and their desire for what they actually wanted? They just now had a new superpower. And have you seen movies where it, the superhero gets their superpower for the first time and they don't know how to use it and they're clumsy and they, they have crashes? <laughs> well, that's the next fear of the crashing now that you've got the superpower. So he gave them the next step. He showed them how to effectively ask them out on a date in a way that they would not feel intruded upon, in a way that they would not reject him. You know, and I've talked about this. I say micro commitments. This, this directly relates to marketing. If you ask for too much, you will get a no. 
So you don't walk up to them and say, hey, you know, would you like to get married? Hey, you know, would you like to have sex tonight? That's an inappropriate way to go about this. It's too big of an ask. You haven't deserved it yet. You need a small ask that is a micro commitment. And if you think about it, the bigger the commitment you ask for, the bigger chance you're going to get a no. So you don't walk up to this woman and say, hey, you know, I'd like to take you to dinner tonight. Uh, how about I come by your place and pick you up at eight? That's not a micro commitment. She's got a lot of things to think about here. She's got to think about, oh, my God, do I want to get in his car? Do I want to get stuck with this guy in a place? I don't even know where we're going. Do I want to wonder if he's going to bring me home or, you know, take me and <laughs> put me in the bottom of a river somewhere? You know, she's got a lot to think about there. That is not a micro commitment. A micro commitment <clears throat> is asking her, hey, you know, I'm going to be at Starbucks tomorrow at noon. How would you like to drop by and, you know, I'll buy you a cup of coffee? Yeah, you know, we can talk, get to know each other. That's a micro commitment. She doesn't have a lot of things to worry about with that. She knows, hey, you know, it's up to her if she shows up or not. It's up to her when she gets up and leaves or stays or likes what's going on. That is a micro commitment. So he showed him how to do that. Here's how you get him to go on a date with you. And he took the whole date thing off. Like most people think a date of, you know, pick you up at eight and we'll go to dinner. He said, no, 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 that's not a date. A date is getting her to say yes to a meeting, right? That's that's your first date, micro-commitment. And he did these all along, and then he did the ultimate one. And the ultimate one was the kiss test. And I know some of you have heard this before, but he said, and he sold the kiss test. This, I believe, was one of his first sales in his funnel, was now that you're up to here, now I've taken you to the point where you can talk to the women, you can get them agree to meet you, you can actually get them on a real date where you are picking them up and dropping them off back at their place. So he's taken them that far down the line. Their confidence now is through the roof, but they're still scared shitless because they don't know what to do next. <laughs> And they desperately want that next superpower. And they know now, or actually they, they may not know, but David D'Angelo came through and told him, he said, look, at this point, if you want to get them to sleep with you, a kiss is going to be the first step. So he's now progressed them onto a new timeline. He dropped them on a new timeline. You got up to this point. Now here's where you are. Here's where you want to be. You want to kiss this girl, make her fall in love with you, have sex, have babies, and life lives happily ever after, right? Or or whatever they want out of that, that general line of thought. <laughs> they might not be thinking that far ahead, but here's the deal. Now, the kiss is the thing. It's not the talk to women. They've already conquered that. It's now... They got to get them into the kissing mode. And he gave out the kiss test. He said, at the end of the night, I can show you with, with, without any doubt whether she wants to be kissed or not. So what that does is it shows them if they can move in and take the next step, or it also tells them if they should not attempt it and avoid the rejection. Because these guys are terrified of rejection, right? That's one of the things that kept them in the background for so long, not even being able to talk to women. So, and he sold this, and it's such a simple thing. And they they bought it. They all bought it. Anybody that got to this point bought the kiss test. And the kiss test was something low. I don't remember what the cost of it was. It was either a it was either a seven dollar product or a you know, it was, I think it was under 20 bucks, basically. So he got, a, if it was $20, he collected a whole shitload of $20 bills at that point in his funnel. And it was just, it was so simple, yet effective. And then once they got the kiss test and now they could kiss the girl, now he sold them the big course. Like 
here's how to take it here's how to take it home and they paid a lot of money for that and they didn't hesitate to pay a lot of money for that because they were up to the point he had taken him there was one step away from getting across the river safely to the pasture on the other side they wanted their their demand and desire was absolutely through the roof and like i said the closer you get them to there the more likely they'll be to pay for it and the more they will pay for it so building that confidence that's how you get your flywheel in your business. You got to figure out in your business, what is your thing? What's your kiss test? What's your what's your lead magnet? What's your how to talk to women? You got to figure that out. Like that's the perfect example of the dating world. But in yours, you probably are not selling dating stuff. You got to figure out what it is you are selling and what is that? what does that look like? If you do what he did and you figure it out and you create a funnel around it, you will do really well. Like I said, within three years, he was doing $20 million annually in sales with that simple funnel. And he had high-end stuff. He actually had, he had the high level of that where they would actually go to a, a conference, a live conference where the whole focus was how to get their faster it was like the next thing was how to date multiple women and ultimately he got up to the course that he sold which i i forget the acronym but it's basically how to be a player how to get any woman in bed with you you know just snap your fingers it was it was basically a course and i think it was it was either 10 or 25 thousand dollars and he actually took people out in the streets and demonstrated it and had them do live trials and actually do what he was telling them how to do. So it was uh, it was quite a funnel he put together and he sold a lot of stuff. And, you know, I'm not advocating that that's a, a good thing to do or the right thing to do where he took them ultimately because that's kind of anti-woman and I'm any of you know me I am definitely not anti-woman so <laughs> I am not about taking advantage of women or anything in that way shape or form but that was his thing and that's how he pulled it off his funnel his marketing his approach was absolutely brilliant and it's absolutely repeatable for anybody all you have to do is figure out what your person wants why they want it, and give them those steps to give them confidence that they can get there. The closer you get them, the more likely they'll be to pay, and the more they'll pay, the more they want it. So it's a it's a simple fairy tale. You just have to follow it, and your dreams will come true. <laughs> and it works in anything. You know, the thing for you is to is to look at what you're doing and, and first identify, am I operating in a profitable market? If you're not, then you don't have the foundation to start a profitable business. So you need to kind of reassess that. But once you do, once you figure out what you're doing, you've identified, hey, I'm in a profitable market. Things should work. Everything's in my favor. You got to put your nose to the grindstone and do the work. You know, like I said, I'll take you to the gym, but you got to do the push-ups. So you, you've got to figure that out and create those things, create your lead magnets, create your opt-ins, give them what they need to have the confidence to buy your product. That's, that's, uh, that's about all I have to say about that. And I, and I've said that so many times in so many ways <laughs> over such a long period and, and every time I say it in a little bit different way, I can see the light bulbs go on. So I, I keep doing that. But anyway, I am shocked that nobody wanted to know what the KISS test was. I I evoked an incredible amount of curiosity there. I'm, I'm surprised I have not killed well, a cat yet. I didn't jump in because I knew the answer, but I'll let you continue, sir. <laughs> Anybody want to know what the KISS test was? Right. This is the moment we find out who the judges are. <laughs> oh, you told us before, so I, I know that. 
Okay, well, Woody's all over it here. He's dying to figure it out. So he said, basically, at the end of the night, you walk her to your to her door. Um, and when you're standing there, he said, basically, you you kind of lean in. And if she leans in, he said, you 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 take your hand and you put it like you're going to go behind her neck as though you're going to pull her into you. And he said, if she if she rears back and acts like that's a surprise and that's like, oh, no, that's off limits. He said, all you have to do to protect yourself is say, oh, you had something in your hair. I was just trying to get it for you. And all of a sudden now she feels like an ass because she thought you were coming in to kiss her and she was going to reject you. And you were really just trying to fix her hair. So it's going to throw her off balance. It's going to make her feel like a heel. And the next time, he said, that sets you up for the next time that when that happens, she's going to go for the gusto. <laughs> and he said, if you put your hand up there and she leans into you and comes forward, it's all over. Game on. Go for it. <laughs> Just that simple. So it gives you it gives you the roadmap to whether she wants this to take place or not and if she doesn't it takes you off the hook from being rejected because you weren't really trying to do something she didn't want you were just trying to fix her hair so <laughs> the the i don't know where the guy came up with this shit but it's absolutely brilliant and it worked i mean how would you like to have a business that was making you 20 million dollars a year he figured it out. A simple thing. He just figured out, you know, what's a big problem? You know, what's the biggest problem I can solve for men? You know, it was the dating thing. And he just came up with a marketing plan, a process. And he was wildly successful. And it's not like he had magical powers. And it it's not like he is a not like he's a really good looking guy either you know his name Eben Pagan like who's going to buy dating advice from an Eben Pagan so he literally created a persona David D'Angelo and he was rarely seen unless he did a live event so the David D'Angelo the whole the just the name of it it sounds sexy it doesn't sound like a guy that he looks like when he shows up <laughs> So he just created the persona that matched the thing. Like if you're going for an avatar, you need to become who they need to see you as. And if you look at Frank Kern, Frank Kern did this. When Frank Kern was, before he got into the internet marketing space, he was a sales guy. He went door to door. He sold dog collars and, and the electric fences to keep dogs in your yard. And he dressed up. It looked, I, I've seen pictures of him in those days. And I swear to God, it looks like a guy that went to Goodwill and bought suits that didn't fit. <laughs> I mean, he was clumsy. He was awkward looking. Uh, and, and when he created his first funnel for mass control, and uh, or actually it was something different before mass control. When he created his first one, I think it was... Uh, something empire and and basically it was it was how to make money online and he realized that his avatar he actually had a name for him was bob but and he had it totally dialed in he knew that bob was a teller at a bank that's who he identified which basically is just a worker that serves other people behind a counter doesn't necessarily have to be a bank but bob was that guy he knew what kind of clothes Bob wore. He knew what Bob fantasized about all day long it was freedom. Bob wanted to be a beach bum. So what did Frank become? Frank moved to La Jolla, learned to surf, lost some weight, learned to surf. He didn't know how to surf. He'd never even been in the freaking ocean. I don't know if he'd ever even seen it. But he moved here, learned how to surf, and became what Bob wanted to be. 
he changed his entire persona for it. And you've seen him like along the years as he progressed, he he moved, he's moved in and out of corporate a couple of times that I've seen. And when he moves in and out of corporate, he completely changes his persona. He changes the way he dresses. He changed the, the way he talks, the way he comes across, everything. He's like a chameleon. So that's all Eben Pagan did. He became a chameleon. He became David D'Angelo, the dating guy, the guy that you would take advice from, the guy you wanted to be. So that's really kind of part of it is becoming what they want to be. Like, I've never really changed who I am to do that. I just, I am who I am. I'm not changing anything for anybody. But apparently there's a lot of people that resonate with me because of who I am. I was already that guy. I was already that freedom guy. So I, I never had to change. But a lot of these guys, when they realize who their avatar is and they realize if they're going to connect with them, they need to change. So look at that as well. You may need to make a change in how you show up, how you appear. If you're working with high level, high end corporate people, you know, you don't show up like me. You don't show up in, you know, shorts and a Hawaiian shirt. They're not going to respect you. They're not going to resonate with you. They're not going to trust you because you're not like them. You have to either be like them or be like they want to be. And, and you also need to figure out what is that? Are they looking for somebody to be like, like, that's who I want to be? Or this is the one I want to work with, somebody that's like me. Very important distinctions. They're little distinctions, too. This, this is all little, very subtle stuff. But it will make the difference between you being just the norm or being a superhero in your market. It'll be the difference between you creating a massive following or you just getting by and scratching through. It, it it really is. It's it's little stuff. It's it's like Perry Belcher said something I really loved. He said he said large doors swing on little hinges. It's the little hinge that'll swing a huge door. So that's what you got to figure out. What are your little hinges? And nail those things down and attach your door to it and swing those things open. <laughs> All right, Roy, you got your hand up there. Yeah, um, I've got a question. Um, I, I'm really loving um, um, Acquisition Air, and um, I, I'm looking for markets where um, they've already been buying leads and paying good money for these leads, and and therefore I assume that um and i and i and i found some and i found one i'm starting with and um i'm assuming that if they've already been buying leads we can figure out how to be able to provide the same kind of leads to them is that a good assumption on my part yes that's a that's a very good assumption and like <clears throat> whenever you're when like like you're you're kind of advancing down the road you're identifying a single identity that that could buy leads from you. And that's, that's like you're hunting. You're not, you're not throwing a net. You're like sitting in the forest with a sniper rifle hunting. And no, I even know some of the people I want to <laughs> have buy my leads, but so, I was just, I didn't want to get too over my skis here. If there was going to be a problem in providing them. <laughs> no, no, I don't think you'll have any selling problem. them. I don't think you'll have any problem providing. Okay. Leads. That's but, all I needed to know. But your uh, your positioning, like you're you're ready to go right in with a presentation. You don't need a lead yeah. magnet for those people. You just need a conversation. And one of the things, like this is the way I used to sell SEO. I never really talked about the SEO. And, you know, that might not be the case here. But what I did was I took them on a self-guided tour to identify a problem that they had. And if you can do that, if you can create some, some revealing questions for them, that really is all you need for your presentation. You don't need anything fancy. Excellent. You know, like your opening question, I tell this pe to people that want to qualify people. 
because you want to qualify somebody to know you're not wasting your time presenting to them. And a really good qualifying question is, are you buying leads that you're email following up on? If they're not, that tells you they don't have the probably the wherewithal to do that. So that might not be your ideal prospect unless you're going to sell them the the whole marketing thing where you're going to do the lead follow-up and, and all of that yeah. for them. But if they're buying leads that are email and they're, they have a system in place, you just identified and qualified a perfect prospect for you. Absolutely. I mean, you, you've got the nail on the head. Now it's time to drive it home. So that one question. And then the next question is uh, how many a month are you buying? And this is going to tell you what the quality that they're buying. Like if they tell you, oh, we're buying uh, 50,000 email leads a month. I can tell you right now they're buying junk spam lists that are probably not converting for shit. But they're doing it because it is working. It's just not working very well. And they're working really hard. They're probably burning email addresses. They're doing a lot of, a lot of stuff that they could, it could be better. So by them answering that, you kind of know you've got your A, B path now. If they're buying a few, if they're saying, oh, we're, you know, we're buying uh, 100, 100 emails a month. And, you know, now you know they're, they're probably buying them from somebody that is generating qualified leads for them. And then you want to go into, do you know your numbers? You know, how are they converting? What are you paying for them? And, and the ultimate question is, if they're working, why are you only buying 100? Is that all they have? How would you like to buy more? Cheaper, better, faster. So if they were buying a thousand a day, for example, it would probably be junk leads. Yes, there okay. there probably are. And the same thing, you can ask them. Hey, you, you know, have you checked your your stats on that? Like, what is your deliverability rate? What's your open rate? What's your conversion rate? And if they say, you know, if they give you really poor numbers, go, oh, okay, I get it. You're you're just buying bulk email lists. So um, now all of a sudden you just painted them into doing something stupid and they're going to feel it. I love it. And then you can go right into, hey, you know, how would you like to buy in market qualified leads? Yeah, this is music to Richard's ears. Like, yeah, I came yeah. up with that shit. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and then they might say, well, what is that? What is an in-market, you know, qualified lead? And that's the perfect doorway for you to tell them about it. You know, so asking the right qualifying questions, you can lead the conversation. You just kind of need to go, when you go in, you can't have it scripted. You've got to know, okay, they might answer this way. They might answer that way. I need to have all that, like, understood so i can lead this conversation like you don't want them to my dad always told me he says you never ask a question you don't already know the answer to if you do you're going to be held in a vulnerable vulnerable position and he never wanted me in a vulnerable position so he taught me never to do that so you always want to ask questions you already know the answers to so you can lead it you want to lead them through a guided tour that they have a problem, and then you want to provide them a better solution. And you never, when you do that, you they call it consultative selling. You never really have to pitch them. You you In some cases, you never even have to ask for the order. In some cases, they'll say, I would love more leads. You know, what do we have to do? How much are they? How do we get this started? And at that point, you're just an order taker. You're just taking their order. I love taking orders. I freaking hate making sales presentations. I have I have built my life about not making sales presentations, but taking people on a guided tour of their problem and then showing up with, with the solution. So if a market qualified lead for them was in the area of 700 bucks, mm -hmm. Knowing that we can do leads that are so inexpensive, what would be a good price 
to go in with all things considered just you know i would i would look at the the overall market opportunity with this particular customer like are they looking for one lead a month or are they looking for one new customer a month because they're paying so much for it okay okay if if that's the case you need to keep your price really high if if you're in a situation where hey you know if i turn this guy on to the right quality leads and and he'll buy an unlimited amount then you might want to drop your price down because you know you're going to push volume and you want to incentivize volume always. You always want to figure out how can I move the most of what I've got? And that's that goes back to analysis. This is analysis, not of the market, but of the actual person that you're talking to. Yeah. What's their capability? How many new customers could they handle? How many leads could I sell them based on that? If it's only a few, then, you know, in the, in the market is high priced, then I wouldn't be afraid to be competitive and be high priced. But if you have an opportunity to like turn this guy into a million dollar a lead month, I'd, I'd drop it down to where you're, you know, you're just making pennies because <laughs> the idea of millions of pennies is very Got attractive. It. <laughs> Got it. Excellent. Thank you, John. That's super advice. Awesome. All right, Teresa. Yeah, a couple of um, technical questions on acquisition air. Can I put the pixel from action um, from uh, acquisition air on a Kartra site? Yes. And how would I go about doing that? Yes, you can. Okay. If you if you have your page open. It's actually on a Kartra page. So right. if you if you have a an actual site built in there, you can do that too. You can just put it in in one of the, the global things that goes across all the pages on the site. But on the page, if you go, let me see what they call it. I'll get you the the actual name of the button. Oh, that would be amazing. There's a there's a button that you push. I they I know you want to be a button pusher, right? I, hey, anything that gets it done. <laughs> I am, I, you know, I'm te technologically challenged. The only reason I'm actually, I know exactly where it is and all that. I, I think they just changed the name of it though. And I don't want to, I don't want to tell you something and then you go look and it's not there. So it's in the top right and it's under the, the little gear icon. Got it. Settings. And then there's a there's a a rollout, and you want to go to, I believe you can put it in the tracking code. And it says embed tracking code into body or embed tracking code into the head. And with acquisition air, you would put it in the head. Wonderful. Thank that's, you very much. I've got one more small question. Sure. Because inquiring minds want to know. Why do I need a paid SendGrid account in order to get the proper API? I mean, I can get an API on the. That I'm not sure of. I was under the impression that you didn't get API access with the free SendGrid. Oh. They may have changed that. I, I can't tell you that with no uncertainty. But it was my understanding that the free SendGrid account that you can get does not come with API access. Oh, okay. I'll check it out because it seemed to me that I got one and I'll experiment with it and see if I can go. Because I know that the tutorial said that you needed a paid account. Yes. And I believe that is why, because you you need the API to sure. connect the two. And I got don't it. think you get API access with the free account. All right. So I'll check it out. Thank you. If you can, if you find out that that's wrong, let me know because oh, when, I will. when we did that, it, that's the way it was. So. You know how I love to call you on these things. Oh yeah. I, <laughs> I have no, no intention of holding on to any thought or, or process that is not correct. I will let go of incorrect in, in a heartbeat. <laughs> John, John, when I was messing with SendGrid, that's a correct you have to have a paid account before you get to the API. The API is the next level up. Ah, okay. That's Thanks, I mean. Richard. That's you what saved I me some research. <laughs> 
All right, Mr. McLean. Uh, hey there, good morning, everybody. Come out and talk to us. Oh, sure, why not? Uh, I'm tired of all that fresh air outside. I'm going to be inside. Uh, Happy New Year to all. I have a quick follow-up question on uh, on, on what uh, Teresa just asked. Is Again, I don't need uh, an API, and I don't need a SendGrid account. I'm offering this service uh, I'm offering this service to people who have a SendGrid account, who already have that bulk. So me personally, to promote the sell this, I don't need, I don't personally need a SendGrid account or an API. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, good. good. Thank you for clarifying that. I have a, <clears throat> a John slash Brady question about I'm having a, about the Google Sheet and the configuration of the um, uh uh, within my account. May I, uh, can I share my screen just to show you what's happening? Okay, sure. And this probably is more of a Brady question. So you're lucky he's on. <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky. This is my lucky day. Uh, hey, Brady, how you doing, pal? <laughs> what's going on, Chris? Oh, living the dream, babe, every day. <laughs> uh, I have, uh, so I've set up a demonstration or a demo client myself, uh, you know, within, within my uh, white label. Uh, so this is me or represents a potential customer. And when I go and set thing, I'll get right to the point. When I go to uh, Google Sheet Access, it comes up with this, that I need access. So I'll say, oh, okay, and I'll yeah. put a message and request access, but nothing ever happens. I don't so get it. Is the, uh, sorry, I don't want to cut you off. Go back to there. See how it says you're signed in as whatever that sheets is. Is that yes. the one that you have? Is that the one that's like you in your profile? Let's check that now. You're going to want to log in whenever you're logged into your browsers. You're going to want to log into that account. That's actually on your uh, acquisition error account. Well, let's see. Uh, the, um, my understanding too, if you click the request, you don't actually have to type anything in there. You can just click request access right? Yeah. and it will send back to the master owner of the sheet. And all they have to do is just click to give you access. To and the master account. owner, the master owner, um, and this is probably a tech thing, but I'm pretty sure, Chris, you're the master owner because you're the agency. So you have access to request to give them access. So that the email address that's in there that says that you're signed in as, that's why it's not doing it. So for instance, like if I have like a personal Gmail account opened up while I'm browsing in one of my browsers across my uh, screen, while I have acquisition error up, it's going to default to whatever Gmail account is open. So you need to open up the Gmail account that actually has access to the Google Sheets on your acquisition error, and it shouldn't have any problem. Can you can um can you walk me? Th uh, I've been trying to do what you described. Can you walk yeah. me through that setup right now? Here's my general. Oops, my general settings. Uh, what email is in your um? What email did you connect your Google Sheet to? Um. When you set up your white label. Yeah. Where where would those settings, I can tell you if I can go to that setting, where would that setting be? Here in the general settings? Um, or, oh, you would you would know, I mean, I, I shouldn't say you would know, I guess, but when you, like right there, it says disconnect Google Sheet. Yes. That's whatever email you use to connect that. Okay. So if. Um, you don't want to disconnect it. Um, because that that Gmail can be different than like a business profile email. Yeah. The question is how many Gmail accounts do you have that you could have <laughs> signed <laughs> up? No, I, I have, I have a number of them, you know, right. of, Chris, the, yeah. at the top of your screen on your browser, open up another, no, no, on your browser up at the top where it says access denied all the times you've tried. Yep. Um, I, open I just, up and you may, this may be like personal information. You may stop sharing, but open up a Gmail um, there, just open, a, up, uh, open up your Gmail account and sure. open up and, and sign into the one that you believe would be the one you connected your Google sheet to. And then in that Gmail account, you should have, like, if you've requested access, the, the access request should show up in that account. And that's where you would authorize them. 
Okay, I'm going to, um, uh, yep, I'm going to do that right now. See, this is what um, what I did, Brady, is I set up a, uh, I set up a Gmail address uh, to use for this specific purpose. And, uh, and I'm going to log into that right now. It's uh, the name of the, the name of the company is I have your leads.com. So the Gmail sheet, the Gmail account I got, the Gmail address is I H Y L sheets at gmail.com. Okay. Now that's different from, so I've just logged into in Gmail. I've just logged into that account. Okay. And then in uh, when I went to connect your account to Google Sheet, I connected it to IHYL Sheets at gmail.com. Okay. And when I go to my profile settings, uh, I have my email address which is different it's not that it's it's a it's a different email address I, I just can't figure out where the disconnect is why so when you when you actually connected your google sheets actually chris you could do this you could disconnect your google sheet and turn it back on but the problem is if it's a different email than you actually connected with in the first place as long as you don't have customers and stuff that have already been sent google sheets it won't matter but if you, if you connect a different Google Sheets, because what I think what's happening is it sounds like you you made that Gmail email address after you connected the Sheets in the first place. So what's happening is you're actually logged in and the Sheets are being sent to another email besides that I have your lead Sheets at Gmail because it's not connected to the Google Sheets, the main general settings page. So how do I reverse that is correct i probably signed up with a different so what i would do is go in and actually disconnect the google sheets and connect it again using that whatever sheets at gmail that you created and then remember remember which one you used <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but see here's the thing i've i've done that thinking thinking about this so i've gone through and i've um going back to share i've i've yeah. just discon i've disconnected the google sheet I said disconnect, right. and then I went right. to connect a Google Sheet. Okay, and and then I chose this. Yep, I've gone advanced. to advanced. Yep, gone here. Site settings. Yep, select, select all. all. Scroll down and hit continue. And then at the top, that Gmail that's open in your browser, like I had you open, is that the one? Is that the same account? Uh, let me check real quick. It That's looks it. like he's got a whole bunch of G Gmail windows open. I'm trying to trying to move the um, share screen window. It's right over the browser. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to get rid, close these windows. Yep. And then the Gmail that you have open all the way at the end there, as long as that email inbox, and I I can stand corrected. Believe me. But if that email, yeah, that's the same Gmail you connected. So if you go back to your actual leads, then your AA dashboard, and you try to get access again, it should now that you're logged into the one, the Gmail that you should, it should allow you to to see them. And I stand corrected. Um, you're signed in as. It might be still attached because that account that is in there might be something else. So. You basically just need to hit, hit request access and then go through your Gmail accounts and see which one it showed up in and, and grant access. But it's okay. Even though it says right here, I'm signed in as this. Yeah, because see, you said before you've disconnected that sheet. So we really don't know what's happened in the past in this, this account. So just request access, go through all of your Gmail accounts, figure out which one it went to and grant access. It's just that simple. I, I can't, um, and I'm doing this, I'm setting this up so that when clients, when I set up an account for a client who's buying leads and they click on the Google Sheet icon, they'll be able to go to their specific sheet 
with their specific information that's under right. the under the umbrella of my Gmail account. Go know? back to your uh, your campaign. Unless, unless they don't have a Gmail account, then they get the request access. You're going to receive those in your email, and then you have to grant them access. If they already have a Gmail account that is all connected, then it'll just show up. But if they don't, they'll have to request access, and you basically just have to grant them access. Click on the uh, the plug or the edit button, either one. Okay. All right. What is that Gmail right there? That's uh, just an existing Gmail that I have. Okay. So that's why it's not pulling up. If you put in that I O Y H whatever, yep. That that right there is the default email that's in there right now. And hit save. See, I've been through that and then I got this. Yeah, that's that's probably going to He's he's probably jumbled this thing up so bad by disconnecting and reconnecting. You might have to get Daniel in on this to. Yeah, to I can definitely get Daniel this. in and figure it out. I this believe a, a, I believe in the training. Home. I believe in the training. It says don't disconnect the Google Sheet on the main thing once you set it up, and I think that's probably what's happened here. Okay, so I would need to uh, submit a support ticket then to. Uh, Daniel, go ahead and put it in there, Chris, and I'll I'll transfer it to Daniel. Okay, and I'll I'll, I'll put in there the information of the sheet, the, the Gmail address I'd like, and so if you reset it, it'll be set in the right place. Correct. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to work through that very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Who's up next here? Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Can I can I ask one? When it is working. Because it's never been working. When a client signs up and they click on the Google Sheet um, icon to get their leads, where will they go? Will they go to my account that I've granted access, or will they just go to their, or do I put their, do I put their email uh, address into? Here, let me turn this back on again. Um, if I'm setting this up, do I? If I'm in a client's account and I click this, do I put in their Gmail right. address for their sheets? Put in their Gmail address in the specific campaign that, that is theirs. That is theirs. So it's not going to mine at all. No, this is granting access to your sheet. All the sheets that are created are created under your account and you're granting access to them to access them because they're not publicly available. They have to be granted access to the person that you say is going to be the owner or the, the editor of the sheet. So, so okay. if, you, if they put in an address that is not a Gmail address or not attached to a Gmail address, yes, that's the only time that you're going to have to grant access, I believe. Okay. So, so if I make a, if I make a, if this is a customer and I'm walking them through a setup and I say, now we're going to, you're going to get information on a Google sheet presented to you. Now we're going to go into here. God damn it. Uh, we're going to go into here and we're going to set it up. I would put in their Gmail account in here so that they get the sheets at their Google sheets. Yes. And if, I believe you can put multiple, like let's say they have an administrator and they have a tech guy yep. and you want all of them to get access. Maybe they have a couple of salespeople. Yes. You can put all the email addresses in there separated by a space or a comma. Yes. And but then it will give access to all those different addresses. Okay. But again, if the address that you put in here is not either a Gmail or attached to a Gmail, like my John at Internet Dominators works on on Gmail because it's attached to a Gmail account. Okay. So if it's attached or a Gmail address, they'll just automatically be granted access because of this. Great. If, if they're not, then they'll get the message, hey, request access. They'll click that. It'll yeah. go to your email or your Gmail, and then you just grant them access for that email address. Okay. But here's the one thing I still don't understand. If I put their Gmail address 
in their setup on their account, are they going to their sheet in their Gmail account to get their information? They're viewing well, your sheet in their Gmail account. Yes. They're do they're viewing my sheet yes. under my Gmail account. They're opening their Gmail account and they're viewing your sheet. You're okay. the owner of all the sheets. I'm the owner of all the sheets. So they all go there and they'll go to their, and I might, let's say I had 10 customers. I'll have 10 different sheets under my account. And mm -hmm. by setting this up correctly, they'll go to their individual, they or Correct. whoever else they choose, go to their individual sheet to get their information. Correct. Okay. It's no different, Chris, than you've set up a document and you're going to give you know, specific people access to that Google sheet. Uh, we're okay. just allowing you to have access to do it in here. But when they set up a customer profile, yeah, they will have their, their email should default into their profile anyways. So my email does not need to appear in that at all. Like this would, I don't need to put mine in there. When, when it's doing an integration, I'm not integrating into mine you're I'm already I'm, on it. You're, it says right there, clients email. Yep. Client okay. emails approved to view this Google sheet. Got it. So you I'm not putting you on I'm, all the sheets anyway. If you log into your account, you can see all the sheets. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not putting it in there. I am. Um, I, I'm, so mine does not go in there. Mine was in the general setup when I, that we, a page that was a while ago that had, that yeah, I set you, up. You put yours in one time and you forget about it for the rest of your life. You All right. We have to even think about that again. Got it. And that that's what may need to be reset. That was in the, that was in the uh, attach or detach the sheet. That's, that's got it. Mine and the account I'm going to use to house all the multiple sheets is what I set up when I connected. Yes. Okay. And when and you that, disconnect, you're, you're breaking things. When you disconnect that, you should never disconnect your, you know, the main, the main sheet. Now I got it. Okay, good. I thought that meant just so you wouldn't have a discon, just so you wouldn't interrupt service, but it's not to do it because it's going to F things up, which apparently it has. Now I'm absolutely what, clear. What I would do is just send on a support ticket and yeah. I will transfer it to Daniel. If he um, can even get on a call with you and walk through it, you should be safe since you don't have any customers other than your internal yeah. customer yourself by disconnecting, I'm hoping. But yeah. um, you wouldn't definitely not want to do that in the future because then all the sheets that went to other customers, you wouldn't have access to that. So that's a no, no for sure. So, so yeah, send in a support ticket. I'll transfer it to Daniel. We'll get you taken care of. Super. I'll do that uh, uh, within the, within an hour. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yes, sir. No problem. All right. Anything else here? just answering a answering a text here all right so yeah the acquisition error oh the other thing i wanted to put out there is i'm going to be at the show next week as far as i know i i haven't i haven't really decided yet if i'm going to be available once i get out there i'll find out but next week might be a dark week because I'm going to be in Vegas the whole week and I might do the call Friday. I, I'm, I may try and pull it off Friday, but I, I probably won't be able to do it Thursday. So I wanted to put that out there. And also I have a couple of extra tickets that are available if any of you guys are there and want to go. These tickets are, they're not the full access tickets, so they don't get you into all the conferences, but they would get you into the show floor and where the trade show is and all of the main, like uh, the main stadium, main seating, but just not the little side shoot uh, conference things that are going to be going on. So if anybody would like to go and wants one of those tickets, shoot me an email at john at internet dominators.com. I need your name, email, and address to set that up. And then you pick up the ticket at the, uh, at the exhibit hall. And that is at Caesars forum in Las Vegas. It's next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. 
So if you guys want to actually come by and see us and tickle Brady in the booth, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> I'll just throw a paper air, play an airplane at him. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have our fleet of aircraft on, on site on the tarmac and <laughs> our, our fleet of little squeeze ball guys. Can you tell me what happened to him? Yeah, he was tickled right in the booth. <laughs> There's a terrible thing. It's out there in front of everyone. <laughs> oh, that's classic. But that's where we'll be. So anyway, if you guys want to get a ticket to that, shoot that email over to me. I have to register them today. So I'll be doing that. And, and I've, like I said, I've only got a couple, so I'll, Take them as they come. First first come, first serve on that one. All right. Mr. Woody, what do you got for us today? You're you're muted out there, Woody. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I um, you know, we uh we launched Forbidden Elvis um uh, in Texas with Craig at, at the Let's Mastermind. And, uh, you know, we got the Stripe account and even a few subscriptions sold. Um, I just sent out a press wire on EIN press wire. And Michael, the gentleman that works with me, he is highly focused on the site bringing in when you opt in at Woody Bl at uh ForbiddenElvis.com. When you opt in, you're instantly invited to subscribe. And so you really can't get any kumbaya moments with people that are just checking out the site. Like I send people there, I go, go. And then they go and they go, I don't want to, you know, I'm your friend. I don't want to subscribe. So I looked at my Facebook mm -hmm. and I have a Facebook for binelvis.com and I figure that's where I should send my friends to just check it out and say something. Uh, you know, so I'm, I know that there is the thought that you don't like social marketing on, on the web page. Because you don't want to pull them off that page, right? Like, well, you, I always say, don't put your social media icons on your website. Basically, you put your website icons on your social media. You want to right. put them to your website, not send them away. But you can absolutely have another page on your site that you can send your friends to that bypasses a, a forced opt in. But as far as like new people coming to the site, if you just have like a subscribe and they don't really know the value of it, they're probably not going to subscribe. They're probably just right. That's what's hit happening. It, hit it and forget it. That's where your big idea comes in. You need a big idea where the call to action is to subscribe, and they're going to have they're going to really want to do it. Like for instance. Um, in, in putting the, the funnel together for acquisition air, I'm going to put a thing like I did a, like a minute and a half video that absolutely nails the whole presentation and selling process of acquisition air, whatever you want to label it as it, it just nails it down. Now I don't want to give them that video until they've opted in. So when I put the landing page up, I'm going to put a big idea, something to the effect of a uh, new revolutionary AI tool that brings, brings you leads to grow your business like never before. Click here to watch a 90 second video explaining exactly how it works and what it can do for you. Now, anybody that's in business that sees that is probably going to click there to watch that 90-second video. And now they're opted in. Now they can watch the video. Now I have a sequence in place to follow up with them. Like, 
hey, where it, what'd you think of the video? Click here to schedule an appointment. And, you know, I can answer any questions that you may have. And obviously that click to, to schedule an appointment is a sales presentation where you're going to close them. And I got this idea from, uh, from Damien at Go Mobile. He was, he was doing a presentation the other day and he said, yeah, he goes, I used to run a sales team. And he said, we had that shit just figured out. He said, we'd get the person on the phone. We would do the, the little elevator speech to make sure they're qualified and interested. It was like 30 seconds. And then if they were, if they said yes to that, and they, they were qualified and interested, he said, hey, just listen to this. And they would put a recording on. They'd set the phone down. The recording went for six minutes. So they'd go out on a, on a break. They'd go out and do whatever. And they'd come back six minutes later when the recording ended. They picked the phone up and go, what do you think of that? And it had already done the sales presentation. It was like, if they thought it was great, it was like, okay, you're ready to sign up or answer objections. And I'm like, damn, that's a great process. We could digitize that. We could totally digitize that. And that's what that funnel I just described was. It's a big idea, qualify them, get them to express the interest, put them on the recording, let them listen to it, and then schedule a call. It's the exact process he used. The only difference is you're not picking up the phone saying, what did you think of that? You're digitizing it. Call me up and tell me what you thought of that. Let's schedule an appointment to, uh, you know, to answer any questions you might have. Uh, give me your feedback. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's a digitization of that process that works so well for him and his sales department. You know, how would you like to automate a cold call center? That's what the, I just did. I took his process from his cold call center and I just automated it. It'll do all the work. It'll it'll take all the rejection. The only people it's going to do, it's going to put you on the phone with somebody that's ready to buy. It's a beautiful process. That's what you need to be thinking about in your business, no matter what your business is, is how do I create an automated sales process? And it starts with a big idea. It's grabbing the attention. Then whatever you're going to deliver is your lead magnet. In my case here, it's a 90 second video. It's going to, it's going to deliver that, create demand and desire, eliminate objections, and then make an offer. And in this case, the offer isn't even to buy the product. The offer is to schedule a call. So it's it's very non-intimidating. It's it's very micro commitment oriented. It follows all the rules that I always, you know, put out there to play by. And I think it's going to work really well. So you just need to figure out, like in your case for the hip, for the forbidden Elvis, what's your big idea? What are you going to hook them in with? Like what's the free piece that you're going to offer them? It can't just be subscribed now. You're not going to get anybody to subscribe to that unless they really understand what it is and you've already had a presentation. There's somewhat of a relationship and it's like, okay, yeah, I'll subscribe. Or so, it's a friend. I just want to jump in really quick because we do have that. We have a lead magnet and it is a okay. free song that you can download and it's very clearly described on the second block under the hero section below the fold. And once you sign up for that, you're put on an email sequence and it is a sequence that responds to opens and clicks and moves you into other channels, you know, based on your activity. And if you get nothing, then you get moved to a you know retention list where we check in every once in a while. And if you click, then you get moved over to another list. So the whole system is set up, you know, the lead magnet is there. Okay. Well, if you've got that you and it's not and whatever's above the fold is not working, maybe you just move that up above the fold. If it's got a good big idea to it. Maybe sure. you just need to get it in front of them faster. Yeah, that's where I wanted it in the first place. And then we moved it down. So I'll move it back there and see what changes. Yeah, is there, is there's not um, any like A-B test stuff in Kartra, is there? Yeah. Yeah, Kartra, oh, Kartra has A-B testing. Okay, I'll but look into that too. The thing is, you've got to send enough qualified prospects to it. Like, Yeah, that's what we're working on now is like buying Facebook ads. And so we just send traffic to the website, collect data and, and go from there. Yeah, like when Woody said, you know, I launched this at Craig's group, 
Craig's group's probably not his audience. So that's, that's, yeah. And it's like a small group and yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's not what I would consider a launch. A launch is, is putting it in front of the, of a, a big enough number of the right people at one time where you're just, you know, you're, you're building momentum and then all of a sudden, you know, okay, we're opening up on Tuesday at noon. Boom. That's a, that's what I, that's what I consider like a launch. It's like a grand opening, but it's advertised and people are drawn to it ahead of time. Like, you know, a launch at, at a mastermind group, that's not really your target audience you're not going to get any valuable information out of that. That's like asking your 10 best friends to, uh, you know, to, to put a comment on your page. Yeah. They're all going to do it because they're your best friends. That's no indication that anyone's going to buy this thing <laughs> by putting it in front of the right audience and, and doing that. And it doesn't really have to be like an all at once thing, you know, people put labels on everything like launches. It's just, you're open for business. And once you're open for business, you have a working model. You, you start prospecting to it. You start driving prospects to it. When you've driven enough to make an assessment, that's when you make your assessment. You don't make it on the first day when only a handful of people have gone through. You can't really say it worked or it didn't. You've got to run, you know, several hundred people that you believe are the right target audience. This is the people that you're going to scale up to. And then you make your assessment off that. Out of 100, hey, if two ordered and maybe 10 opted in and two ordered, now you've got some numbers that are viable. You can say, okay, well, you know, out of 100, we had 10% opt in and we had a 2% conversion to sale. And then you can look at, okay, in a 2%, I know how much money that equates to. That means if I spend money to drive traffic, it has to be below that for me to actually make a profit. But until you actually drive enough volume of the right traffic through, and I'm not, I'm talking about the right traffic, not just people. People give you no value in, in knowing your numbers. You have to have like the real live fire audience, the audience that you're going to scale to, to actually understand your numbers, your true numbers. Well, our Elvis fans. Yes. Yeah. If, if you're not, if you're not just counting the actual Elvis fans, you're, you're counting bogus numbers. It's going to throw your figures off. Like don't consider Craig's group, your numbers, throw oh, those numbers no. out the window. No, it was just a line in the sand where we threw it up. Yeah. We went online. We have the stripe working and we're collecting money. Okay, cool. But, you know, find the audience, market it to the audience, run a few hundred people through, and then look at your numbers and say, okay, you know, how did this work? And if it didn't work well, let's say you didn't get enough opt-ins and you didn't get enough sales, that tells you, and, and if it was the right audience, that tells you your messaging wasn't right. If the product is right, the audience is right, and it doesn't convert, it's the messaging. So maybe you need to work on the big idea. Maybe you need to make a better offer. It's in that in that creation piece in the messaging. If uh, if you've got if you've got the right numbers, um that'll be easy to tell if the messaging is right. Michael, can you throw, can throw up the webpage? It's, it's not the webpage, Woody. We're not sending traffic to it. We're not, we're not actually putting numbers into the webpage. We're in, we're in that process. You told me to do the press release. I did the press release. Now I got to focus on putting the ads up and, and I got to put the pixel on there and, and all that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, you need to get to that point before you start making assessments of, you know, is it is it right or is it wrong or is it broken or is it is it working? Once you get those numbers, you look at those and you say, okay, well, clearly something's broken. And then we look to find where the break is. Like if they didn't opt in, then it's your front end big idea. If they opted in and they didn't buy then it's in right and we just don't have the numbers yet is what it is like we haven't okay. sent thousands of people to the web page to see what they do like we're, we're working on that yeah yeah i'm so, only one person so so you're you're on target you're on track 
you're you're getting there. We got to get your flywheel moving. <laughs> you got to push real hard to get that thing to m start spinning. <laughs> yeah, and you know this is for Woody, but also for everyone else. Like you know, it really is important to just pick a direction and stay in it because if you keep turning the flywheel back and forth, you're not going to create any momentum. You got to keep spinning it the same direction. Yep. Yeah, you got to keep on pushing. <laughs> All right, Mr. Richard. Sorry about leaving my mic on and your guys hearing my phone ring. Apologies. Sorry about that. Oh, I, I didn't even uh, notice that. Well, you <laughs> muted me right in the middle of it, so I figured somebody knows. Anyway, thank you. Um, the question I have, now that we're into it and we're starting to lose people, uh, I want to get a little bit into the weeds here. I sent you an, uh, an email to which you responded laughing out loud that... Uh, our payment and service agreement is uh, to be lit litigated in Ohio. <laughs> and oh. you were talking, is there going to be any way where we can edit that so it'll actually be for our particular area, or could you at least do it on the West Coast where yeah, you are? That's, because that's, I mean, how is that going to work, or do you know have any thoughts on that? That was that was just an oversight from where the actual attorney is. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, are we going to be are we going to be able to edit that at some point, or is that just going to change to your locale, or what's well, what what's thoughts on the, that? The base one really is from us covering the system, so that won't be editable on on your side, unless you do like an enterprise version where we're rebranding the entire system over to you, which you know I've made mention of that. We're we're going to open that up, I believe, to probably two people in this year. To test it and see how it works but it's going to have to be people that are on enterprise level you know you'd have to be moving at least fifty thousand leads a month for three months even to qualify to open that discussion but yeah i got my eyes on that i understand that okay yeah. um if th there's a number of things that i i was um getting ready to to train my salespeople on how to onboard their clients because i've I've come to the decision that what I think the best thing to do on this is rather than having to have my own 13 page service agreement and trying to get customers to look at this thing, that's going to be a, that's not going to be just whiskers on the cheese. That's going to be a whole herd of cats standing behind <laughs> nothing, you know, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, I want my salespeople to first off establish a relationship, keep the relationship. Onboarding is very easy; it's five minutes, but that way they have some interaction and stuff with their people. Um, and looking at that, there's a lot of places in there where there's stuff that I'm not sure that you guys really mean for the clients to be able to see this and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm just curious, as because I've got about four or five or six of those things, should I just make a screencast and send it to Brady or whatever and, and get a feedback? Because I'm noticing that there's stuff like it says, you know, it gets to one point, it says one of six, page five is missing. Two of the pages are not clear as to what questions they're supposed to be answering. Another one, or they, they ask a question, There's a go, then it goes to a, I think it's number four and then or three and then it goes to four which asks the question which was back on two and it's and it's showing pricing on there i you know i want to give away uh the ai site leads because we're going to be charging enough that it's not going to make a difference and if we're giving them this the website leads that's kind of a freebie that's a bonus but i don't want to have them if i'm giving it to a free i don't want them to get to a page that you're being charged 99 cents for this or and you've got a monthly fee of this i mean it's showing all this pricing and stuff on there over which we have no control which is sort of yeah kind of bothers me that I, is that going to be you know what where are we going with all that yeah the control panel really is what it is it's not like you know a lot of that's not editable that's just the process that we've put in place it's just a matter of learning it um so as far as like it's up to you, like when you're going to run your business of how you're going to put people in, if you're going to run a white label and let them create their own account and, and manage their own account, or if you're going to manage it for them and, and just, uh, you know, run it that way. If, well, if you're I, want it, to, I want it to be a high, I want it to be a hybrid. I want them to be able to, to feel like they have control and they, 
So they're responsible for turning their campaigns on and off. And, and with that explained during the setup and that sort of stuff, but I do want to be able to have them know the salespeople, have the salesmen have a reason to get in contact with them to keep those relationships. So we're not doing the stupid idea of I'm a SaaS company. Here's your product. Bye bye. And you never hear from them again. Yeah. I don't think that's a good way to keep a customer. No, no, and it, it's not. I mean, what I would do is if you've got sales guys, I would get the sales guys trained on a standard operating procedure to create the campaign for the client, for their client, and then transition that over. If their client even wants access to manage their own campaigns, then you give them a, a you know, a training session on Here's, you know, here's where you go. Here's what you click on. And they're never going to go unless they start, you know, clicking under the hood and, and exploring around the whole thing. They're not going to do that. They're just going to go in and do what you taught them how to do. And, and, you know, if they do, if they go off in the weeds and, it, you know, it raises a couple of questions or whatever for them, that, you know, that just is what it is. But 99% of them won't. They'll just do the minimum required. They'll go in, they'll, you know, in most cases, um, I've played around with a lot of people that are running campaigns and I've had people set the campaigns up for them. All they want to know is it's working, it's running. They're not going in there trying to figure out all the, all the buttons and levers <laughs> and options and all that shit. They don't care. Well, my thought there was they might want to do things like change their keywords or add keywords or take them out and do things like that. And yeah, then and that's that stuff's all easily accessible from one page in the control panel. They're not going to be setting it up or, you know, all that stuff you were describing, all that's in the setup. Okay. So I would, uh, basically what I need to do is create my is create explanations of hey. This is in beta. You're seeing a lot of stuff that's not necessary. Don't worry about that. Just yeah. here's the part you're going to be worried about. Don't worry about the man behind the curtain. We're still in beta and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's the beauty of having things in a beta environment is you can get away with that. You can say, hey, you know, don't worry about that. We're still working on it. Um, here's your section. Just, you know, operate in this box. Okay, one more thing. One yeah, last thing. Could you when, show me when we're on that though? Before we move off of that, there's a there's an option you might want to build into your business model that could potentially get you more money. Is we're we're we've actually put this in is a white glove installation service where you set the campaign up for them, and most people will take that. You don't have to make it a lot, but you could give your your salespeople a, an initial perk that say, hey, you know, if you want to charge them a hundred bucks, that's just all you. That just all goes into your pocket. And then you set it up. It'll take you 10 minutes to set it up. You made an extra hundred bucks. It incentivizes them to make another sale because they're going to be able to easily make that extra hundred bucks. And it works for everybody. It works for you because you don't have the client. You don't have the headache of like getting in the middle of it all. Your client doesn't have the headache of trying to understand something new. They don't want to understand. They just get what they want. Everybody's happy. So, or you, you know, you could decide to just provide that service for free. But I think you might be leaving money on the table because once someone is in forward motion of making a purchase. Making an upsell is really, really easy. And that's a perfect upsell that just should go through like grease lightning. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a good idea. I, I like that on a number of levels. Okay, the last foobar is, is after going through all the stuff and supposedly getting all my credit cards and stuff set up, apparently uh, the credit card failed again, even though there's only one credit card that's supposed to be in the system there, and it canceled the subscription. So could you literally show me where in Kartra you can actually access to correct your payment information? Because I've tried it, I've done it in a couple of different places now. It's still failing. It's still not working. It's still turning off my ACT uh, program <laughs> access. Um, help, please. <laughs> Well, I sent you, I had sent you a thing that said that ACT 
was going to expire on the 4th or something, and then you could re-sign up for it because that was, I think, the date you wanted your billing on anyway. Oh, oh, that was what that, okay, well, yeah, obviously, so that, that was, was our conversation that wasn't reflected in an automated email. Okay, I forgot. Gotcha. That. So the okay. so the plan was to have it expire today and have it cancel, and then you could re-sign up, and then you'd be on the right credit card, everything will be smooth going forward. Okie dokie. <laughs> I, I think I sent I think I sent you the link, but if I didn't, I can send you the link again to to sign up for that. Yeah, that would be really, really good. I appreciate that. Okay. But it wasn't um, a, it wasn't a faux pas. It was meant to do that today so you could be on the bright billing cycle. The faux pas was between my ears. It's okay, John. It, I, I get a lot of that, you know. No, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> you get in your 70s, the mind starts going. That's why I'm taking all kinds of supplements to try and stave that off. So the oh, other stuff, the other no, stuff. Don't I'll, remind I'll... me, I'm getting too close to that myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm going to uh make a screencast and send it off to Brady of the stuff that I'm seeing, just so that it's on the record, even if it's not gonna change or whatever. But I wanted to okay to a verification back as to what things we can do and what things we can't do or whatever. So yeah, Thank you. Uh, absolutely. And we we do truly appreciate the feedback because, yeah, I mean, if we can simplify this moving forward at some point, once we get all the all the wheels greased and moving appropriately, we can take a look back and say, OK, how do we in the next iteration, you know, what can we do to make things better? Of course, that's why we're doing it. I figure that that all bad news is really good news because you can fix it. If you don't get the bad news, you don't know what to fix, and then you really look bad. Uh, the last thing, do we have any testimonials yet that we can uh, take advantage of or people that are using this or, or examples or anything like that for uh, testimonial-related kinds of things? I think we've got a couple of really rock-solid case studies that could be used and rebranded. I also have... I've been collecting that stuff. So I've been just like sliding it into a folder until I'm ready to, to deal with it. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to just put it all together and make it available. I've also, okay. I ordered that, uh, they had a year end special on that in video. Uh, so I got the NVIDIA so we can actually make some promotional, um, generic promotional videos, like the 90 second video I was talking about. I'll be able to make that stuff and then, you know, give that out as, because I know everybody was biting at my heels for me to create the marketing materials for everybody. And I'm like, Oh, whoa, whoa, don't put that on me. <laughs> We're just offering the software, <laughs> but I was just buffering time. I do plan on helping you guys out with all that. I just okay. need to buy some time. Okay. Two things, John, how soon can, can I put you on the spot for how soon can you get some testimonials or, those case studies up so we can have access to those because we need to have that built out because that's really be helpful. That's a, and, uh, on the, and I'm just, like I said, senior moment here. What was the thing, what we were just talking about? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm getting this. I'm right behind you on the senior moments. So. <laughs> yeah, well, after the, the, Oh, and video, by the way, I did the in video and I was wrestling with that along. And here's, here's a pro tip for the in video is that, if it's almost perfect and you say, I just want to change this one thing and change it all, tell, it will change the whole, every time you hit regenerate, it changes the whole thing. Unless you tell it, this is all okay. Do not change anything except for this. Not then it will do that. Otherwise you'll, you'll burn through all your minutes telling it to correct this. And then it corrects that, but then changes something. I mean, you really you have to use your longer prompts like you like to use for the AI. You yeah. really need to tell it after you chew, you then swallow. You know, if you forget the swallow, then all you're doing is putting stuff in your mouth and chewing. You know, that that's what AI does. It's still not that smart yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm playing around actually with several new AI tools right now. I haven't decided like which is the best of the best, in my opinion. When I do, we'll do a review on here and I'll show you. <laughs> But I'm working with some image tools, image creation tools that are just like, like blows the stuff away that I've seen before. And another one that I'm looking at is a, it's an AI tool where you can feed in all of your documents and it will take all the documents and it will create a Q&A. 
It'll, it'll build like a knowledge base of your business and your products and all of the, like, we're going to pipe all our Q and a questions into it. And basically it will learn your whole business. And then you can have an AI chat bot on your site where the, you can say, Hey, if you have a question, ask the chat, just like chat GPT, but it will be trained on your business and your products. And Basically, they'll go and instead of going in and, and doing a ticket where we actually have to physically address every ticket, they can go in and they can ask the question. The chat bot will answer them in real time, like right now. You don't have to wait for the support chat person to get back to you. It'll answer them right now. And I can almost guarantee you we've already answered any question that we're ever going to have with the exception of just some bizarre shit. And if it gets a bizarre shit question that it doesn't know how to deal with, it just sends us an email and it says, how would you like to respond to this? And then once we answer it, now it knows how to respond to that. So it's building its knowledge base all the way through. So it's is that uh, going to be, is that going to be white labeled so we can use that? Or is that uh, just something that you're building? And can you give us instructions on how to do it? It's probably very easy to white label because I don't think we need to put anything in there, you know, with a, with a brand name, we can strip all the brand name stuff out of it. So yeah, it probably will be, you'll, you'll probably have to buy the software if you want to use it, but then we could give you the, the script to upload, to train it. That's, that's actually the, the hard part, as you well know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Buying the software, that's easy. Anybody can do that. But if we have, you know, if we have the document that we've trained ours with, we could, you know, easily give you that and you can train yours with the same document. <clears throat> so very. Uh, that very would be spectacular. Cool. Thank you, John. Very cool stuff. I mean, I can't believe. Like I've done a lot of launches, a lot of product releases, you know, a lot of that stuff over the years. And I just can't believe like, I don't know if it's just maybe my skill level at this point, but this, the launching of Acquisition Air has just been such a piece of cake. And, you know, from the marketing, the chat GPT assistance, writing all the copy, just everything has just been smooth as glass. You know, and Brady getting the bright idea of actually pulling the programming team in to answer the questions in the chat so they understand the pain. That was just brilliant. <laughs> That's just so I don't have to answer questions I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, for those of those who are old enough, Nadia Komanich, <laughs> having been the first female uh, gymnast to ever get a 10 in the Olympics, and then she got five or six more of them. Uh, yeah, there's something about continued skill over time that's really, really helpful. Uh, but I really want to ask the, the pointed question of, okay, it went smoothly and it was a wonderful launch and <laughs> kudos all the way along. However, what was the actual timeline between, okay, this is, I think we need to do this to launch day. I'm willing to bet that was close to probably nine to 10 months. Yeah. Oh yeah, easily. It was, it was probably, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to say probably first quarter of 2023. Yeah. That, I mean, having, having just done this launch and seeing what it's involved in launching this one, all I have to do is take this little package here and figure out as well. That's taken me almost three and a half months here, probably four by the time it was actually beginning to have the wheels turn. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. it's straightforward but it ain't simple and it takes a lot of heavy lifting and uh, research and all that stuff to come up with all the stuff to get all the pieces to fit yeah but it was i mean it was a long period of time between like getting getting access to something that worked like the tech stack just getting the tech stack to do what it does that was like one point in time where it came to fruition and then from that point, it was like me directing the programming team. Okay, this is awesome. You know, this is something I can really get behind, but I need it to be this way. I need to format it this way. I need these functionalities. I need it integrated to Kartra. <clears throat> from that point, 
it was probably about three or four months of their work where I was not on the hook. I was just gliding by going, you know, if they get that, they get that figured out, then I'll go to work. <laughs> so it, it wasn't like it was blood, sweat and tears on, on my part. It was finding the right teams, putting the right people in place, doing the right things. And, and it just went really, really smoothly. Well, I think we, I, 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 as you know, I'm <laughs> probably this. This is a this is a this is generational wealth for you guys that haven't figured that out yet. You really need, you know, this is this is something that just. I've been doing sales for over sixty years now, and this is the first time this level of lead has ever been available anywhere. So, I mean, come on, guys, realize that what you've got here is literally unicorns and rainbows it really is yeah but like like from the outside from you guys watching this process it probably looked to you like you know oh and he knocked this thing out like overnight but uh there was there was there was a lot of pieces to the puzzle that i had you know i was building one at a time you know you eat the you eat the elephant one bite at a time and uh we've got that elephant just about eaten up now <laughs> i had hair at the start of this project <laughs> that's classic but uh but yeah i'm lucky yeah and you can tell i've still got my hair so i was effective at at delegating <laughs> i hadn't quite figured out the old bull mentality yet when i started john <laughs> well on the next launch you'll have it wired Amen to that. <laughs> All right. Well, very cool. But, you know, it's it's been a lot of fun for sure. And there's a lot of fun ahead. I mean, I can't wait till we get to the to TNC next week and, <clears throat> and really start exposing people outside of my list to what we have here. Because, again, very few people outside of our core little list here even know about this thing yet. So it's it's going to be interesting to see how the rest of the world, if they get it or what we have to say to get them to get it, and then it'll be interesting to see the the time frame period of how it long how long it takes for adoption. Because I can I can see this thing like a year a year to two years out being fully adopted, and having everybody using it, and you know having everybody just making a fortune off this tech. So I'd you, love to be involved in those conversations when you find out the, the feedback we can yeah. build up belief chains and uh, objection ladders and all that crap and really, really streamline the copy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like I said, Friday, uh, the show runs Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm probably just going to stay in Vegas because I'll be, I'll be dropping Brady off at the airport Friday and then I'll probably stay and do the call Friday so I can give you guys a, a live update on Friday of you know how it went, what what went down, who went down, who got hammered. <laughs> it is Vegas, you know. There's maybe there'd be things I don't I want to just leave there. <laughs> yeah, what happens in Vegas stays on YouTube. No, I think I think uh Brady said it said it best, you know, we're going to be working our asses off in this booth and probably have our heads on the pillow by nine or 10 o'clock. <laughs> Don't worry. There's plenty of ash you can rent and buy there. If you work <laughs> yours off. <laughs> oh, that's classic. <laughs> sorry. Did I say that out loud? That was supposed to be my inside the head voice. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend anyone. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, Woody, what do you got for us? Uh, you know, I uh, took my 21 handwritten. No, there were a lot of pages handwritten. I worked, you know, on the, the uh, Forbidden Elvis story. Um, and I've come out to 21 typewritten pages. And it is now, you know, and essentially... It's got a beginning, it's got a middle, and it's got an end. And I, but what I want to do is feed it all into chat 
and of course, you know, spit out either a, a treatment so I could sell it to Netflix or a, or a short story and publish it as a book. So I'm... Uh, what the fuck was I just thinking of? Now I've got a senior moment. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, yeah, utilizing Chad GPT to give me those two things. Now, I did play with it, and I said, put this bitch in the words of um, David Geffen. And it was like, ladies and gentlemen, it is, you know, my honor and privilege. But I'm talking about 21 pages, and you talked about prompting thousands of things. So... I would like my assistant to feed all that shit into AI with the instructions of give me something that I can uh, pitch a producer with and then to, you know, a book. And every time you put something in chat, it, it doesn't mean it's all going to go together what you put in last time. Correct. You know what I mean? So... How would you do it where, you know, um, you know, where you're getting the printout of something like in the words of Steven Spielberg, tell this story. Yeah, you, you tell it just like that. I mean, you tell the chat exactly what you want and look at the output. If the output isn't what you had in mind, um, Here's something I've had a lot of fun with is insulting the chat bot. Like, tell it, you know, really? Is that the best you can do? I expected more out of you. And the first thing it'll do is it'll apologize and then it'll spit out better content. And if if you if you pre-prompt it, like telling it who it is, telling it it's the best of the best and all that. You're really setting it up for that. It's going to feel bad about letting you down. <laughs> but don't be afraid that you're ever going to offend it because you're not. Don't be afraid that it's going to walk off the set and go home and leave you stranded. It's not. It's uh, it's just, it's really a cool thing. So can I put all 21 pages in at once and then I, ask it the, the command, then command it to give me the, I don't know if you can do that with chat GPT chat GPT has limitations on how many words or how many characters that you can put in, but there are some other ones that you can use. Uh, John, what you have, you have to, the, I found it's worth, if you're going to be doing this, if you guys are in business, spend the 20 bucks and sign up for Poe P O E oh, yeah. because it lists all of them. If there's an AI out there, it's listed and you're covered and you've got subscriptions to everything with that. And ChatGPT will give you plus or minus 500 words in and 500 words out. Poe will do 75,000 words. So yeah, it'll take a 21 page document Woody, you just put it in there and Poe will actually be able to do that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was that was the one I, I kept thinking Claude, but Poe is... Uh... Poe also. That's, That's P O E like Ed Grallon. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Poe. So all right. Well, cool. If uh anybody else before we wrap up. Uh John Gregory. Yes. Man, you had me worried. You you freaked me out for two days. Tuesday morning, you had to not join us, join us, you know, you and I, and then I I text you back, and then I didn't get a respond all day Monday and all day all day Tuesday and all day Wednesday, and I'm like something time at the chat. Oh, <laughs> you kept me oh. up at night. <laughs> well, you know, on on Tuesday, I had I had a uh, an appointment with with a uh, with an attorney that I knew was going to run long, and the only time he had was that morning no problem there and when i looked at when i looked at yours i had you down at nine which i think you thought it was noon no you had you had me down we would i i showed up at nine i was there at nine o'clock you, you took me okay. a few minutes prior and you said i can't make it can i talk to you after 12 and i said yeah 
And then I never heard back from you again. Okay, gotcha. Because I thought you thought it was noon because I saw that you had logged in at noon and I tried to log in right behind you and you were already gone. <laughs> oh, no. Because I was, I, I did have noon open, but. Uh, well, uh, anyway. and then I just okay. been buried yeah. over the last few days when you text me this morning. Uh -huh. uh, I didn't realize I hadn't sent out the call reminder yet. I'm like, oh, shit, <laughs> I got to do that right now. <laughs> Okay, I was good about that. Yeah. So uh, if you have any time for me today or tomorrow, let me know. Okay, I'll text you. I may. I got to go do some stuff yeah. right now to get no, ready just, for the show. You give me your best hour. I'm not going anywhere for the next two days. All right, cool. We'll, we'll thank get you. you in. All right, thank you. Bye. All right. All right, everybody. Well, this uh, this will be our, our last call before the big Vegas event. And then, like I said, Friday... I'll uh, I'll go ahead and schedule that, and we'll we'll do our call on Friday next week. So, you can get are we doing a crypto call scheduled yet? I did move that one to the following week because of the because of the scheduling error. So, the crypto call will be the following Thursday. So not next week, but the week after, and I'll send out an update on that one too. Try not to have too much fun, won't you? Or oh, yeah, I'm, I guess I could probably <laughs> do that one too from Vegas as long as I'm staying Friday. So I'll think about Maybe that one. We might do it next win, week. win some Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we'll have bigger news by then too. Yeah. That'd be nice. uh, yeah. Did you notice from uh, from Uphold they sent an alert out this morning and and XPR had a eighty nine percent buy and twenty one percent sell. In other words, the, the the buyers and sellers, the buyers were in the were in charge of the market today on most of the cryptocurrencies, but Bit XRP because was there was a big the top of the list because there was a big correction yesterday. Um, yeah, almost five hundred yeah. million dollars worth of Bitcoin was liquidated. The <laughs> the speculation is that everybody's picking up the um, the Bitcoin they're going to need for the ETFs, which is good news. Yeah, mm. yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on right now, and they. Uh, XRP had a, a big drop, which I got to tell you. Did you was, have a limit order? It was, No, but what I did was I had my uh, my 2024 Roth IRA. And I had just moved the money into the account. I hadn't made any purchases yet. So when that XRP dropped, I was on it. <laughs> oh, you, you <laughs> timed it. Good job. Yeah, I mean, it was just pure I kicked luck. myself for not having a limit order in at 50 cents. <laughs> it was just pure luck, but I hit it and was very happy about that. Oh, good job, man. Good job. Yeah, but uh, the other thing I heard, too, was Binance, like the biggest exchange in the world, has now removed XRP. No kidding. That's what I heard as of yesterday. I don't know you know, what's behind that, or I don't know anything other than I just heard that Binance mm. removed XRP from, from public uh, purchase. You can hold it, but you can't buy it. Wow. And the, and the person that originally told me about this years ago, he laid out exactly how this whole thing was going to go down. And he said, right at the end, he said, XRP is going to be removed from public purchase access and whoever has it has it and you won't be able yeah, to yeah that's get interesting it publicly so. cz has been under a lot of scrutiny lately and they and under a lot of law threats so maybe they just since binance is the biggest maybe they cause them strong arm them first yeah but i wow this everything everything this guy told me years ago has absolutely come to fruition and we're down to like the final pieces of what he said and they're just they're just falling down like dominoes that would be really good. I wouldn't oh. wouldn't mind seeing XRP hit six figure this or five figures this year. I'm not greedy. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind seeing it being removed from public access. No doubt. <laughs> at, at this point, <laughs> save all but a little mom and pop exchange, and you can still buy it on Uphold, though, right? You can today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about tomorrow, but you can today. <laughs> Not a bad idea to put in a limit order twenty percent or so below whatever you want to to bag to if uh, if you have dry powder because that that spike would have filled some bags yesterday. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, that is awesome. Well, I filled the bags when it when it happened in the, in the Roth IRA. So I was really, really happy about that. The whole oh, last week, the whole last week of last year, I was on like pins and needles thinking, oh my God, don't spike yet. Don't go up yet. Don't go up yet. I I need 2024 to load that Roth again. <laughs> they're still they're still gonna try and shake retail investors out. So yeah. Yeah. Those monster spikes do that. Yep. Yep. Up or down. Correct. Up they sell because they think they're rich and down they sell because they think it's crashing and be gonna be over. So yep. yeah, they're 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 definitely they're definitely end times on it where they're shaking retail out. They don't want to yeah. sell. No, a lot of FUD. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. All right, guys. Well, have a great week. We'll uh, we'll be back on in the Friday next week, and and we will see you then. If you have anything you to too, point on, then shoot, hit me up, and I'll uh, see what I can do. Cool. All the you guys have fun in Vegas. Ashore. Thank you, John. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. John, have a good time in Vegas. <laughs>